Chapter 11 Standing on the Rock When people are deeply devoted to extreme deeds of darkness, chaos often replaces any resemblance of order, and responsibility is generally neglected. Billy Mac's lifestyle has drastically changed from his day of fretting over being a thief. A significant amount of time has passed, and though Billy's conscience might have, at one time, had a problem with much of what has become his M.O., he has become strangely comfortable with his choices and actions. Billy now has a bold confidence that he never knew before. He feels empowered by his new freedom, freedom in accepting that he has a right to do whatever he wants, which is basically freedom from his conscience. Everywhere he looks, he finds others to compare to that give him more justification for his growing worldview of moral relativism. All of his new friends are in total agreement and help support each other in standing and fighting for their God-given right to freedom and equality. In the name of opposing intolerance, they are freed from condemnation and judgment. Or are they? After overlooking the minor violations of accumulating parking tickets, Billy Mack is finally summoned to court before incurring a warrant for his arrest. This, of course, would put a significant damper on his freedom, so he decides he better defend his story to the judge. Of course, in Billy Mack's delusional mind, he finds a perfectly just cause to be absolved of all charges. After cleaning up and putting on some clothes that, let's just say, he doesn't often wear, Billy Mack decides it would probably be best to take the bus up Straight Street to the courthouse uptown. Just a couple of blocks off of Straight Street and 12th, a business district transitions into some of the government agency buildings. Only three blocks from a popular shopping area, this section of town is regularly busy with pedestrian traffic. After Norm let Billy Mack out of the bus, without so much as a glance from either of them, he checks his watch and sees that he is plenty early and still has time to relax. He presses the button to cross Straight Street and make his way over to the courthouse. It's not quite 10 a.m., and his court hearing isn't until 11. Billy feels energized after actually getting a night's rest for a change, and he is already looking forward to getting his big responsibility out of the way so that he can meet up with a couple pals who are expecting a successful transaction of the hard stuff later in the afternoon. Adjacent to the courthouse is a courtyard with some benches and walkways that connect the varying parts of the city. Billy Mack decides to detour a bit with his extra time and go sit outside instead of heading directly into the lion's den. As Billy approaches the center of the courtyard, he sees a fair crowd built up around a man standing on a box speaking with a small amplifier. The man has some sort of props on both sides of him with an arch connecting them. He finds this public entertainment a much more interesting option than sitting on a stone bench alone, so he moves in to satisfy his curiosity. The man speaking has an earpiece microphone that sends his voice through a 6 by 8 inch amp out clearly up to probably 70 to 75 feet, since there's not much car traffic in the immediate area. His arms wave about as he speaks enthusiastically with his hands, pointing up to the sky, then down to the ground making swoops across his front with both hands open and into tight fists as he speaks with strong emotion. The props at his sides are portable signs on sign poles. To his left is a red homemade stop sign that, instead of saying stop, says, Don't pass go. On the back of this sign is the distinct image of a goat. The other sign, to the man's right, is a green circle that says, Get out of jail free. And on the back of that sign is an image of a sheep. And above the man's head, in an arch connecting the two signs, is a colorful rainbow with the title, Monotheistopoly, the very real game of life. In front of the man is a space with a half circle written in colored chalk on the cement to serve as a borderline for the crowd. Also, there is another box just inside of the border in the center, also with a microphone and amp. Before Billy Mack can really focus on the man on the box's words, he is extremely intrigued by the scene and smiles as he wonders exactly what kind of crazy spectacle is going on. All right, for another dollar, what's the current leading cause of death in America now? The man speaks out while the crowd begins to answer with unamplified shouts. Old age! Cancer! Drunk driving! As the man on the box listens for the right answer, 
he instinctively denies false guesses with a variety of humorous quips. Then, as he consciously performs his primary function as game show host with the people, as if in the other side of his brain, he finds himself seeing the same scene in front of him in an entirely different context. In this moment, that doesn't fully hit his primary consciousness right away. He finds himself standing on a rock just a few feet in diameter that is surrounded by ocean as far as the eye can see. Somehow, he knows that not far behind him is a tremendous mountain of pure gold that rises out of the sea and is far bigger than Mount Everest, though he doesn't need to turn and look to know it's there. In this few seconds of time, he mysteriously finds himself throwing fish food out in the water before him. He also throws out nets that go out from the rock he stands on. Also, he sees, out in the distance, buoys that mark long lines of baited hooks anchored on the deep ocean floor. He knows that there are all kinds of fish out there in the water. Some he can see, and many more he cannot. As he looks into the water, he sees many quality fish schooling up because of the nets. But he also sees many sea creatures like slithery eels, hard-shell crabs, and shape-shifting, color-changing octopus that he knows will probably never be caught. Nope. No. Nuh-uh. Give up. Prescription drugs are now the leading cause of death in America. So watch those doctors. So no winners here. Apparently, you're all losers. The amplified man antagonizes jokingly to playfully get under the skin of his hearers. All right, let's go for the big one. For $10, the grand prize jackpot, who here thinks he is a good person? Several people raise their hands and speak up, and he picks one that would seem to be at random. You, sir, you think you're a good person? He asks. Yeah, the man replies. All right, step up on the box and we'll see if you are. If you are a good person, you will get this crisp $10 bill. And if you're not, I'll give you a consolation prize of $1, okay? Our sociable director states. As the man agrees to the stipulations of the final round, Billy Mac is excited to watch this impromptu game show and see if maybe he can't get some money too. He works his way into the front row in case he can get some answers right and make some extra cash with his well-planned timing. I'm Ray. What's your name? The elevated speaker asks. Regal, the street game show contestant replies. All right, Regal, where are you from? Our host asks. Fort Worth, Texas he says. Wow, all the way from Texas. I'm originally from Alaska, and I must say, that's a cute little state you have down there, the quick-witted man on the box jabs. The nice-looking fellow smiles, shakes his head, and drops his eyes in defeat. Okay, Regal, I'm going to ask you just a few questions to see if you qualify to be a good person. Have you ever told a lie? The conversation orchestrator asks. Yes, who hasn't? the man replies. How many lies have you told? Ray returns. I don't know, too many to count, Regal says logically. What do you call someone who tells innumerable lies? Ray retorts. Well, a liar, I suppose, Regal says sheepishly. Yes, a liar is what you call someone who tells innumerable lies. So what does that make you? Ray pushes. A liar, Regal says, not entirely comfortable with that particular truth. Have you ever stolen anything, regardless of its value? Ray inquires. No, not really, Regal says unconvincingly. Are you sure? You just told me you're a liar, Ray puts plainly. Well, yeah, when I was younger, Regal answers with the standard answer. And what do you call someone who steals stuff? Ray replies. A thief, Regal is forced to answer with his conscience bearing witness. And so what are you? Ray pushes to drive home the point. A thief, Regal admits, not exactly liking where this is going. All right, Regal, one last question. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Asks Ray. Yes, Regal says, realizing he's not passing the good person test. Jesus says if you look with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart, Ray explains. By this time, Billy Mac is finding himself very bothered. He's beginning to realize what is going on, and something inside of him doesn't like it one bit. So, by your own admission, you're a liar, a thief, and an adulterer at heart. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments, 
which we've just gone through three, would you be found innocent or guilty? Ray tests. I guess I would be guilty, Regal says even more sheepishly in front of the large crowd. And since you would be guilty, would you go to heaven or hell? Ray asks. Well, I'd go to hell by that standard, Regal consents. That's right, you'd go to hell. Does that concern you? Ray asks with all sincerity. Well, I've never really thought about it like that, but now that you mention it, I would be a bit concerned. Billy Mac is now almost fuming at this charade of false advertising, this intolerant judging and unacceptable condemnation of imposing one's beliefs on others. Well, you should be a lot concerned. There's nothing worse than hell and the fact that it's for eternity. Do you know what God did so you don't have to go to hell for your great many sins? Ray brings home. No, I don't, Regal answers in reluctant curiosity. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life where he never violated God's laws and to die a substitutionary death in our place so that we could be saved, so that we would realize we have sinned against a holy God and rightly appropriate that truth by repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. We broke God's law, and Jesus paid our fine in his life's blood so that we could be set free, Ray completed. As Ray was saying those words, looking directly into the eyes of Regal, he once again saw, or more, felt, the scene of his vision. Only now there are some fish caught in the nets, and he can see the buoys afar off bobbing from something biting down out of sight. And as he finishes his gospel presentation, he sees a giant shark fin rising out of the water headed straight at him. Hey, who do you think you are? Billy Mac is almost surprised to hear himself say out loud at Ray, but he instinctively continues. You go through all this to try and sucker people in so that you can reign over them with your high and mighty beliefs? Billy isn't slowing down his general boldness being extremely amplified, compels him to make a serious point in order to stop what is going on and even help the people be free from the injustice of this man's intolerance. The pride of his life's purpose is now being put into action. I can't believe how much time you've wasted setting all this up like some fisherman trying to hook into innocent bystanders who are just going about their business. Your self-righteousness makes me sick. Billy Mac invokes, now two steps inside of the chalk line. Self-righteousness is when you proclaim your own goodness, like saying you're a good person when you're not. Ray rightly answers in the spirit as he immediately prays for God's wisdom in his response to this obviously hostile heckler. Emboldened by the experience and the unseen forces within, Billy Mac addresses the crowd. Don't listen to this wolf in sheep's clothing. Look at how deceptive he is. He bribed us all with money just to listen to him and play his religious games. Then Billy redirects his words to Ray. Don't you have anything better to do? What kind of religious fanatic nut are you? We're just trying to enjoy our day and you want to condemn us all to hell? I cannot condemn anyone. The Bible says you are condemned already because of your unbelief, Ray says quickly. By this time, Ray notices that a couple things are happening with the crowd. Most are shocked and standing stunned in observation, but some of the more mild ones are being scared away by the nature of the heated confrontation. In Ray's mind, he initially hoped the confrontation would draw a bigger crowd, but then the vision came again. The shark is attacking the nets and chasing the fish around in a frenzy. The nicely condensed schools are being scattered, and the nets are getting torn. Some of the fish are writhing free from the nets because of all the commotion. Ray has to do something. What's your name, sir? He asked Billy Mac. It doesn't matter. You don't know me. You don't know any of us. You just want to condemn us and boost yourself up by trying to gain control over us, Billy Mac says back sharply. Well, how about you? Do you consider yourself to be a good person? Ray aims at the heart of the matter, for he knows that the dog who yelps is the dog who got hit. Yeah, I'm a perfectly fine person. But I'm not interested in hearing your self-righteous opinion about it. You can take your book of so-called standards and shove it. I can give you a hundred books of different standards that would leave you guilty, Billy Mac emphatically states. Billy Mac's ranting escalates as the contents of his heart overflow out of his mouth. His foul mouth begins turning more people away, 
and Ray keeps trying to speak up and regain control of the scene, but it just isn't working. Something in Billy Mac is set on breaking it all up, no matter what kind of spectacle it makes of him. The confrontation does draw the attention of some newcomers, but as they move closer, many others move on with their day. Finally, a police officer comes to establish some order where it had obviously been lost. What's going on here? The policeman asks the two. Billy Mac loses no boldness in his cause and immediately answers, pointing at Ray. This guy is out here yelling at everyone that they're going to hell. I'm not the one yelling, Ray tries to say through Billy's accusations. Look, he set himself up with all of this, pointing at his set and amplifier, and has been harassing everyone who walks by here, Billy continues. What's this? The cop asks, flipping Ray's wire that runs down from his earpiece microphone. You can't be out here with an amplifier bothering people like this. No, sir, it's public property, and I have a permit for amplification, Ray defends himself. This is the courtyard to the courthouse. You'll have to find somewhere else, the officer replied. No, officer, this isn't against the law. Ray tries to uphold the reality of the law to the law officer. Don't tell me what the law is. Look, I said that's it. If you don't cease and desist, I will arrest you for disrupting the peace as well as disobeying a police officer. So get your stuff picked up and get out of here, the officer enforces. This isn't the first time Ray has been shut down unlawfully, and he submits to the authority who is even in the wrong, and he begins packing up to leave. While he is putting his things away and the people are all scattered and lost, his vision returns briefly. The water around the rock has no more nets or buoys, and it is calming down from the disruption. He knows the cause of the disruption is the vague shadow under the surface that is swimming back down into the murky depths. He then remembers the glorious mountain and turns to look up at it. It is so magnificent and wonderful that he immediately rejoices in it. He knows it is entirely unmoved by the ruckus and looking down with great approval. Meanwhile, Billy Mac enters the courthouse to tend to his parking tickets. Chapter 12 The Narrow Path It's been nearly a year since the scales fell off of young Ricky's eyes. He's been growing rapidly in sanctification, and he has been unabashed about faithfully speaking out to the lost. His entire persona has changed, and he is now a totally different person with a totally different focus and direction in life. Through the Lord's great providence, Ricky has been blessed with a great faith and a progressing number of solid biblical teachings and materials from elder brothers and sisters in Christ. The most fundamental lesson Ricky has learned thus far has been about the function of God's law, the Ten Commandments, in its role to show what sin is and to humble the proud people who think they are good enough to go to heaven by showing the reality of God's high standard which their consciences attest to. This perfect law of liberty is meant to leave us helpless in the face of our sins, leaving us nowhere to go except to the feet of Christ on the cross for His completely merciful forgiveness. In all his study about the Ten Commandments and its use by most biblical Christians he has followed with the Holy Spirit, Ricky has greatly wondered why one of the commandments is supposed to have been altered and somehow fulfilled by Christ, when all the rest remain undisputed sins. He heard the references to Christ being the Lord of the Sabbath, which of course He is, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which is true. But to Ricky, it only seems obvious that Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of all, and that the Sabbath was made for man, because it helps man stay in God's narrow path, setting him apart from the world and serving as a shadow of things to come, while simultaneously recharging him both spiritually and physically. Whereas the condemned idea of man being for the Sabbath refers to a legalistic mentality that seeks to serve the ordinances of God only as a necessary requirement of God, instead of in right understanding of its intended purpose, that is, to benefit man and his relationship with God, which benefits God's purposes. So Ricky has decided to stay on the safe side by remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy and for rest like the commandment commands and he can see no reason why it should have changed from the seventh day that God himself hallowed at the creation of the world to what is now generally thought of as a Sunday sort of quasi-Christian Sabbath that somehow only accounts for part of the day. 
Ricky regularly studies the issue and assesses all of the arguments about Jesus being our rest in place of the Sabbath. And even though true daily and eternal rest is found in Jesus, it seems to Ricky that our rest in Christ doesn't necessarily abolish the weekly function of the fourth commandment. For Jesus himself said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. This being the final step after the condemnation of the law for salvation, that is, the grace that is given to a humble heart. While the law still serves its function to show us what sin is, it's still a sin to lie, it's still a sin to steal, and so on. And so why wouldn't it still be a sin to not remember the Sabbath? It didn't make sense. God himself took a rest from his work when all things were perfect. Nor did it make sense that we still wouldn't benefit from an actual day of rest amongst a life of toil for livelihood physically in a fallen world as well as a rest from spending ourselves fighting against the world for the Lord spiritually. Plus, Ricky saw so many people who seemed to get utterly consumed with their work and personal interests that they could hardly make it a whole day without dwelling on these things. And if he was right, then the devil has been very successful at dismantling the fourth commandment into a day of personal party time, for Saturday has become everyone's favorite day to spend on themselves. Ricky sees no reason not to take Saturday as the holy day it was intended to be, to dedicate to the Lord, and to be on the safe side of his concerns that it may still be sin not to regard one of the great commandments of the Lord. He found great potential in that men may have given up a commandment of the Lord for their tradition, as the Bible mentions, probably by the ongoing diligent deceit of the devil working hand in hand with his greatest ally, the flesh. Of all the times where Jesus told his followers that if they loved him, they should keep his commandments, Ricky hasn't found sufficient scripture to convince him that what Jesus meant was to keep all of the commandments but one, or to transform the fourth into an assembling of the saints for an hour on Sundays. And as he furthered his study on the subject, he became increasingly suspicious of the hypocrisy of all the Christians who refer to the Ten Commandments, when really they should be saying, the Nine Commandments, and or maybe kind of part of the Fourth. Then when Ricky found scriptural references to Sabbaths in the end times, and on the new earth, he found more than enough justification to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy and for rest. Besides, this commandment is not burdensome. So even though Ricky is very aware that he is a new Christian, and that no other Christians, other than some cultish factions that he does not agree with otherwise, seem to agree with his conclusion, in fact, they condemn him for it, often with attitudes very out of the spirit, which never helps a Christian's argument. He has to go with his own conscience and reasoning, and though he ultimately figures all the great evangelical elders, and everyone else is probably ultimately right, for how could he be the only one to be right about this? He has decided to follow his understanding, conscience, and conclusion through until the Lord sees fit to illuminate his understanding with the revelation everyone else seems to have. Besides, he knows that with the pure intentions of his heart, taking the entire Saturday for the Lord will only be a blessing for him and for the Lord. He often prays about it, for he doesn't want to disobey God in any way. Plus, it makes him feel dangerously close to the false religious cults who do advocate the Sabbath. But, he found, those cults who promoted keeping the Sabbath usually have some strings attached that are obviously in error, like, you go to hell if you don't keep the Sabbath, or, that you will receive the mark of the beast in the great tribulation, etc. Ricky is very cautious about theology that has gone off the rails of orthodoxy. Subsequently, Ricky has resolved himself to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy and for rest. To him, keeping it holy means sacrificing his selfish desires and excluding any secular work or secular interests and committing to focusing on things above, the things of God, which are holy. Ricky finds the time to be a great shadow of things to come, the day when all things will be holy and totally free from sin, and an encouragement to keep a heavenly perspective, which makes the wicked things of the world stick out all the more the other six days of the week. Keeping the Sabbath holy has made Ricky much more aware of sin and the world's distractions, and just distracting noise in general, and he finds the benefits of remembering the Sabbath growing exponentially which gives him encouragement that he is in the Lord's will. Ricky still struggles with controlling his thoughts that tend to drift back to his normal focus of work, secular study, and pursuit of self-interest. But he is learning to control that, 
and he strives to master his own mind and take every thought captive, as God's word suggests. Ricky has also begun to make physical sacrifices on the Sabbath to instill self-control over the flesh and to keep the day holy by eating healthy. He excludes much of what he normally likes to eat that is generally unhealthy. He made a list of things like sugar, chocolate, butter, mayonnaise, and other generally unhealthy ingredients that he consumes regularly the rest of the week. Ricky knows this is not necessarily a requirement and that he is not being a legalist, but he feels that it coincides with keeping the day holy and sacrificing the self, and he is finding it as becoming very beneficial for him and the spiritual purposes of God as well. Both physically and spiritually, Ricky notices that he is becoming more self-controlled and focused on what is good, as well as opposing what is not. This regular, once-a-week practice has already begun to overflow with fruit into the rest of the week. He is increasingly cutting back his unhealthy eating habits, thus gaining more self-control over his body, as well as increasing energy. Also, Ricky's embracing of quiet time on the Sabbath has helped him to have more patience and a peaceful countenance, which causes him to restrict unnecessary noises throughout the rest of the week, like excessive secular radio or music. And when he feels like listening to something, he plays faithful materials like audio Bibles or other faithful drive-by studies to fill the time. It didn't take long before he realized that even if he were to become convinced that the fourth commandment was no longer necessary or that it was altered, he would continue the practice without hesitation for in keeping the Sabbath holy, it really makes the selfish reality of the rest of the world's Saturday stand out. This made Ricky wonder that if he were possibly right about the Sabbath issue, then that would mean that the devil has basically succeeded in subduing an entire commandment, one that's made to help man fight against him. This thought made him think about how the devil has managed to abolish the second commandment completely for the Catholics. On this particular Sabbath, it's after a Thursday, Friday, four-day weekend, which gave Ricky time for a three-day fast with a day to recover on his healthy regiment. He has done several single-day fasts, which he found hard enough, but he kept seeing the prevalence of fasting in Scripture. He noticed that Paul fasted regularly and that fasting used to be a big part of Israelite life. Jesus even said that certain demon spirits are only overcome by fasting and prayer. This indicates that, somehow, Fasting gives the child of God more power to overcome the devil and his minions. So in the final afternoon of Ricky's three-day fast, he found that it was surprisingly filled with grace from the Lord. The foreign feeling of not consuming anything but water for days had become somehow acceptable, and he was amazed to even find a good enough mental focus to read, study, and learn. Though there had been times of ups and downs, and a fair amount of naps, Ricky was encouraged to realize more of the power of God's grace. Another thing Ricky noticed during this time fasting was that whenever a thought to pray about something would arise, he quickly, without hesitation, dropped into prayer. Approaching the Father was almost immediate, like praying without ceasing, for it has been said that fasting to the Lord is like prayer in itself. The Bible calls it afflicting yourself and it is an extreme denying of the flesh and personal sacrifice for the purposes of God. As the world goes on worshiping their stomachs and filling them like a consuming void that can never be satisfied, God highly appreciates this particular sacrifice, and He honors it as the dedication of worship and self-denial that it is. Ricky's fasting prayers are always filled with thanksgiving and are significantly more focused, and, as fasting also makes him more patient, his prayers regularly go deeper than he would go normally. This alone is worth it, he feels, and it makes him feel lame in his usual prayers, which makes him want to fast more. This is the positive snowball effect. Of course, every once in a while, thoughts of food infiltrate Ricky's mind, and often he finds himself thinking deeply about the specific delicious foods he loves. Regularly, it crosses Ricky's mind that all he has to do is go into the kitchen and grab something scrumptious to eat. In one such moment, we translate into Ricky's subconscious, where he and his flesh are, once again, at odds. 1,500 feet off the ground, Ricky is slowly and steadily walking a tightrope between two great mountains. There are three smaller mountains far below, and the wind is blowing steadily as he tightly grips a 15-foot-long balancing pole. Though Ricky is focused on getting to the other side, his flesh is hanging from a rope 
that's attached to a harness around his waist. His flesh just hangs on and slowly spins back and forth in the wind while his weight pulls heavily on Ricky, forcing him to focus intently and watch each step. Ricky's flesh moans and closes his eyes so he doesn't have to look down, and only every once in a while does he make a suggestion. Ricky, buddy, why don't we just call it good? We've done more than we've ever done before. Let's grab some good healthy food and regain our comfort. This is killing me, man. Ricky just continues to ignore his flesh, which proves effective. The tightrope walk is an extreme example of the narrow path that Christians must follow. The narrow path isn't always just a single, wide, pebbly path through a forest of potential problems. Sometimes it can be so narrow that you barely fit, not unlike a camel through the eye of a needle, when only the power of God's hand can push you through. Sometimes the narrow path is a fine line of slippery rocks beneath the surface of a river and its powerful current, where the heavy flow of thick water and pressure from the world instinctively strives to force you off of your feet. This is where constant aggressive pressure against the flow is necessary to compensate in order to not be swept off the path and, potentially, over a waterfall. Sometimes the narrow path is nothing but old footsteps made in deep snow that have frozen enough to last through a rainstorm that melted the surrounding soft powder, which then created foot-sized pillars of ice that have been again blown over with new, deep, dry snow, hiding the path's very existence from your sight, where one blind step in that heavy snowstorm must be placed slowly and deliberately, using senses beyond the eyes, in order to keep from sinking into the impassably deep abyss surrounding the narrow path. But being on the path is the biggest key to keeping the path. Chapter 13. The Thrill of Deceit During the passing months, Jack and Betty decided to get married. Although they had always professed marriage as an unnecessary formality, it just felt like the next step for them, since they had been together for over three years. There were financial benefits in their general drift toward increasing responsibility, and Betty seemed to start liking the idea of marriage more, for some reason, somewhere along the way. So Betty had, for months, been unleashed in planning and preparing what had somehow become their dream wedding. Her parents would come down from Maine and play their part, as well as Jack's from Florida. The location, decorations, catering, and color coordination had to be perfect for this once-in-a-lifetime event. There was so much more to a wedding than they both had realized, and after months of studying Wedding Magazine and fulfilling their desire to make it as grand as they possibly could, they ended up tripling their budget. Something about it all seemed romantic, more so to Betty, of course, and so it fueled a passion that hadn't really been met elsewhere. All the flowers, the setting, the catering, so many friends and family, the especially stylish tuxes for the groomsmen, and, of course, the designer dresses for the bridesmaids. It was going to be the day and night to remember, that ultimate dream date that blows all other dates out of the water. It is their public showing of love and dedication and style to go down in the record books for everyone forever. On the Friday before the Sunday wedding, Jack and his cronies are driving back from the gym in the afternoon. Jack hasn't seen the other woman at the gym for a while, but he had met her several times to work out, and even met her for coffee once to keep the door open. Then, ultimately, his conscience knew how much was at stake, and so he would call from a comfortable place and give some excuses as to why he couldn't meet her or work out together more. It didn't take long before she realized what was up, and moved on to find herself someone else to fill the void. So this is it, buddy. You're really going to go through with it, aren't you? Jack's unmarried, but involved, best friend questions. In the split second between a quick reply, Jack's inner struggle flares up again. In Jack's subconscious, he sits in his recliner with his flesh pacing around him. His flesh is definitely bigger and more intimidating, but Jack is very comfortable with him. Jack is trying to be cool, but he is definitely unsure of his situation, while his flesh is very sure, sure that there is rapidly becoming no way out. Yeah, of course, we've been together for over three years now. I don't see that changing, Jack replies. Yeah, but that's the longest relationship you've ever had by about two years, Jack's plain-speaking pal states. 
Though the wedding had been agreed upon and planned for almost five months now, it hadn't seemed nearly so real as it does on the verge of the actual wedding weekend. Inside the car, there is a momentary silence as neither Jack nor his closest friends seem to know quite how to put their thoughts into words. In Jack's mind, his flesh knows how. I tried to tell you about this back when all this silliness started. You're 32 years old, man. Are you really throwing in the towel forever for Betty? You know you want more. I mean, I know there's always divorce, which is no big deal, but it's such an ugly thing to have to go through and have on your record. He paced frantically back and forth, as if trying to find the answer like a needle in an undeniable haystack of an immediate inevitability. The plans are rock solid, their parents are already in town, and everything has been paid for. There's no way out, Jack's flesh thinks out loud between biting his nails. Jack just sits there in his recliner, just as he is in his car, trying to look calm, cool, and collected. He is committed, and as with all other things in his life that he's committed himself to, he is going to have to write it out, come what may. As Jack drops off his last friend before heading home, his pal states, All right, buddy, we'll see you at nine. When nine o'clock strikes, Jack is in the elevator, ascending up to his most swanky bachelor friend's penthouse uptown. Bentley is, in a way, Jack's most revered friend, that friend who is the coolest, richest, most in-control-of-this-world guy, who always seems to have everything he wants right at his fingertips. Jack holds Bentley close, as if he were a vital pillar holding up his ideal self-image. Bentley is the one friend that Jack often tries to impress in whatever way he can. Time spent at Bentley's penthouse is always a good time. Cheers erupt from the 20 or so guys in Bentley's penthouse as Jack comes through the door. It is another good reason to party in an unending line of celebrations. And even though the marriage doesn't really fit in with their usual party theme, its severity offers an equally severe opportunity to party. Someone immediately pours Jack a beer into a chilled glass from one of Bentley's multiple taps behind his private bar. Bentley's place is as immaculate as ever. It seems that he is constantly remodeling or adding new artwork to his repertoire. A smile alights on Jack's face, and he feels right at home. In fact, he wishes it were his home. All the standard interactions and usual conversations go on, redesigned with the latest trends and terminology and newest jokes, in a heightened spirit as everyone grows more and more uninhibited for the exciting Friday night on top of the city. Bentley eventually breaks into some special bottles of alcohol, and as always, it is a thrill that everyone takes in glamorous stride. By 11.30 p.m., everyone is feeling primed. Jack is the star of the show, of course, and he loves it, especially when Bentley draws near to him to give him special attention on his last real night out as a free man. Then, an hour or so later, as they are all partying in the game room, Jack notices Bentley slip into the other room for some time. Then when he returns, he announces to everyone, The moment you've all been waiting for has arrived. Let us migrate into the living room. The floor-to-ceiling windows on the outside wall of the penthouse give the entire place such a rich and prestigious feel, with a view out high over the entire city, as if it were under their feet. As they round the inside corner wall to the living room, the men have their arms around Jack, giving him all of their increasingly sloppy attention. Jack is enthralled by his many great friends, constantly giving him their focus. And when they sit him down on the couch, they stand over him for a brief moment in silence. Then, as if on cue, the wall of men separate to reveal one lone woman sitting at the bar, all dressed up in perfect elegance. The woman grabs her champagne and turns toward Jack. She looks at him intently, takes a sip, and then stands up and walks over to him. In Jack's head, his flesh is already bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Of course, the bright eyes are a bit blurred. As Bentley puts on some music he deems appropriate, Jack takes one big drink of his hard alcohol, finishing the glass. By the time he puts it down, someone hands him another glass filled to the brim with the smoothly alluring gold liquid shining in the penthouse lights. In Jack's subconscious, he is in his recliner once again trying to act calm, cool, and collected. 
But as things progress in stereotypical bachelor party fashion, he becomes more and more uneasy. All the while, his flesh is dancing around, hooting and hollering encouragements at him, building him up in front of all of his friends. At a certain point, Jack's friends step out of the room, and he realizes he may have to use some self-control in order to not to let it go too far. He knows his friends think nothing of going all the way on your bachelor party, but his conscience is on a slightly different level than theirs. When this thought makes it through all of the surrounding hype, he, once again, meets his flesh in the mental arena of conflict. Jack and his flesh are on the roof of the massive skyscraper above Bentley's penthouse, which is one of the highest buildings in the city center. The Friday night energy electrifies the air. The noises of the city so far below are constantly reaching up and creeping over the ledge as a slight breeze kicks up and dies back down. The air is refreshing and just being up so high above the city is exhilarating. The multicolored lights are blinking in all directions, even moving above in the night sky. It's always amazing to realize how busy the atmosphere is high above the busy streets when one takes the time to look up. Smack! Jack's flesh slaps Jack hard in the back, grabbing and pushing him a few steps toward the edge of the roof, leaning him over to look down the great distance to the ground. This is it, Jack, your last big leap. After a moment of looking down the edge of the building to the streets below, he glances at himself and realized he has on a jumpsuit with something strapped to his back. Then, looking at his flesh, he sees that he too has a jumpsuit and a base jump parachute tied on his shoulders. It's now or never, my friend. It's time for Jack Kempler to go out with a bang, his flesh says, tugging on the shoulder straps to make sure they're tight. Jack, realizing the serious nature of the issue, tries to hold down the other side. Wait, it's illegal to base jump without a permit. It's against the law to do this. What are you talking about? It's Friday night. The cops have more important things to do. Plus, no one will even see. No one ever looks up at night in the city, his flesh retains. Taking a step back from the ledge, Jack says, Even if I make it out alive, this could seriously come back to haunt me if anyone finds out. Man, no one's going to find out. The scene is airtight. The only ones who know you are here are your best friends, and they're into it, man, his flesh pressures. No way, I can't do it. I'll regret it for the rest of my life, Jack tries to take a stand. Don't be ridiculous. You'll only regret it for the rest of your life if you don't do it. What's the big deal, man? You've made jumps like this many times before, and people are out there doing it all the time. This is just part of life, if you're really living it. Everyone knows this is what happens sometimes. Come on, let's go. Jack's flesh backs up to where they can make the run to jump clear of the building. Jack walks toward his flesh with his head down, unsure, but also lured in and definitely willing, like a kid who knows he wants to break the rules, but isn't sure if he'll get caught and if it would be worth it if he did. After reaching his flesh, he looks back at the ledge and begins to think about the process of gaining momentum, making the steps to get safely clear of the edge and thus the building. Then, mentally following through with the visualization of all the rest of the steps, he thinks about how thrilling it would be to free fall for several seconds, and then how he would put his left hand to his head to counterbalance his right hand, reaching behind to deploy the lead chute by throwing the monkey's fist, lying tied into a knot like a ball, in this case a two-inch ball just right for grabbing with one hand when your life is on the line, from behind his waist straight out to the right. Then he entertains the thought of how fun it would be gliding down between all of the exciting action of the city, finding a street or sidewalk that he could pull a landing on and quickly make a getaway. That would definitely be something he would remember for the rest of his life. After contemplating and visualizing the exciting event before him, he is closer to wanting it for himself. His flesh puts his hand around his shoulder and says, Are you ready, brother? Jack feels the moment, and his senses are enhanced with focus. Time seems to slow down for a moment, as he instinctively drops his eyebrows down over his intensely focused eyes as he peers forward beyond the edge like a hawk ready to take flight. Let's do it. Yeah! Jack's flesh yells like the king of the jungle over a fresh kill. Then they crouch down almost into a running starting position. Let's do this! You're the man, Jack! His flesh encourages. On three. One, two, three! 
They simultaneously drop hands and lead off on their front foot, accelerating toward the ledge. Then, in a split second, at the maximum speed of their short sprint, they step up with one foot on a hard vent cover and then step up with the other foot on the low ledge wall that surrounds the roof, launching headlong into the night. They begin to drop, falling flat with their arms and legs out like flying squirrels, pulling away from the building and falling more and more vertically in the gap between the other buildings on the other side of the street. With their speed rapidly increasing, the rows of floors and the high-rises begin to pass like dashed lines on a freeway. The streets below close faster and faster until it's time to pull the chute. The four seconds of freefall stretches in time, yet passes in the flash of an instant. Snap! Snap! Both chutes open, and Jack and his flesh quickly reach up for the toggles, pulling them down free from the Velcro in order to gain steering control. Immediately, they both yank down on one side to turn before colliding with the building on the other side of the street, dropping a quick oval 360 degrees while making a split-second choice for the best landing direction. They both find the same side street that's not as hectic as the main drag, and even though it's fairly busy too, they know they can come in and basically land on anything, as long as it's generally flat and there are no poles or wires to catch or moving objects. The slow traffic below affords them a bit of comfort, as they can know that they shouldn't land and be immediately run over. Coming in, Jack is just ahead and left of his flesh, and their approach is clear of any catches. With plenty of horizontal room ahead of them before the next intersection lights, they come in hot and fast, swooping down almost vertically and planing out right above the traffic. The high velocity gives them more power in their chutes to afford maximum options for landing, but the usual ground effect bubble is a bit broken up by the movement of the air from the traffic. Flying horizontally just feet above the cars now, Jack and his flesh skim along with their feet up, waiting to flare out at the last possible point, utilizing every bit of their speed in order to stall themselves out just above their ideal stop spots. Jack manages to catch a gap in one of the oncoming traffic lanes and lands with a quick roll angled toward the sidewalk. He bounces to his feet and immediately begins to recoil his chute from off the street. Jack's flesh is on the right side, hovering along with the flow of traffic, and with the traffic just under his feet, sees Jack drop out of nowhere. They all begin to break and slow down. Some honk their horns. Jack's flesh is perfectly timed as he pulls down hard on the air brakes. Holding the stall until the very last minute, he stomps down right on the roof of a yellow cab with one foot, then steps ahead as the cabbie begins to brake, not yet realizing what is happening. And then, as the cabbie hits the brakes to stop completely, Jack's flesh steps down the windshield, makes a quick step on the hood, and then, with one last big step as the car stops out from under him, he steps down on the ground, stopping flawlessly just in front of the yellow car. He landed with a perfect moving transition in a world of moving hard angles. Yeah! Jack's flesh juts both hands straight up over his head in glorious victory, Toggle still clenched in his fists as his chute gently collapses over the yellow cab's windshield, blocking out the gaping mouth and wide-eyed face of the utterly shocked driver. Jack's flesh turns around to look back at the stop traffic and laughs out loud with the heartiest laugh Jack has ever heard. Immediately, Jack begins feeling paranoid and starts looking out for cops. He then fully gathers up his chute in order to make a quick getaway. Jack's flesh pulls his chute down off the cab windshield by the strings and points to the cabbie with a huge smile on his face. The cabbie nods completely dumbfounded, still in shock. Jack and his flesh quickly jump in and are off with their big secret in tow. Chapter 14 Fraught with Danger Norm was assigned an unclean spirit when the forces of darkness realized he was being so fervently prayed for. The demon power did not indwell Norm, but traveled with him wherever he went. So when Norm rejected the evil minister's advice not to meet Edna at the park for coffee, he called for backup and was provided three other spirits for the occasion. The park is fairly quiet, as it is just before dusk, and Norm and Edna see each other from afar off 
long before they reach one another at their slow paces. Hi, Norm. Thank you for meeting me, Edna greets. Hello, Edna. It's my pleasure, Norm cordially replies. Shall we get some coffee and then find a place to sit down in the park? Edna asks her casual acquaintance. Sure, Norm replies, not exactly sure why he would go out of his way to meet Edna, though she seemed to be wise and understanding. In the physical world, there is nothing out of the ordinary as the two casual acquaintances head for the coffee house. However, in the spiritual world, things are considerably different. Norm's four accompanying demon spirits stalk and hover around Norm on the opposite side as Edna and her four angels. The angels and demons rarely take their eyes off of each other, and the wicked spirits constantly spit, grumble, and blaspheme. Encounters like this, in such close proximity with the angels of heaven, always make the demons extremely nervous and agitated. All of the spirits are mindful of one another's swords, and it tests the faithful servant's self-control whenever the filthy ones blaspheme. Norm's spiritual orb, which hangs faithfully above his head, is now a light gray, and his new and unknown companion has noticed its lightning over the past months. This makes him all the more nervous, for in their world, failure usually results in punishment. Edna's blood-red orb is so disgustingly repulsive to them that they will not even look at it. Even the light emanating from her is a major irritant that keeps them at bay. People have their alternate appearances, and the third-party life forms of light and darkness are often on the move traveling vertically in and out, as well as horizontally among the land dwellers. Certain areas are enshrouded with an unusual heavy but transparent darkness, while others are more clearly lit for some reason. Sometimes there is little to no supernatural movement. Sometimes there is much. After an uneventful stop for coffee, Edna and Norm returned to the park all warmed up with light conversation about random pleasantries. The demon spirits are growing more and more restless with the angels in such close proximity, while the angels remain straight-faced, focused, and all about business, although it is much more than business. The elderly Caucasian lady and the quiet African-American man, who is about the age of her eldest son, meander over to a park bench to have a seat. They both sip their preferred coffee drinks, now beginning to open up with the help of the caffeine. The angels spread out and position themselves strategically on the four corners of the two, only about ten feet away in each direction. This really bothers the demons, which is part of the intent, for now they are surrounded and have no comfortable side. Finally, Norm comes out with his most prominent question. So, Edna, why exactly did you ask me here today? Edna straightens up, preparing for action through words. All the spirits are listening intently, and the spiritual air begins to get tense. Well, Norm, I have something I want to tell you, something I want to give you, and it would mean the world to me if you would just listen, Edna begins. Norm nods in agreement, listening intently, as he lives a pretty private life and doesn't have many friends he talks to much. Most of his socializing is during work on the bus which means it is always a very shallow, single-serving type interaction. I've always enjoyed your company on the bus, Norm, and I think you were quite a nice man. Many years ago, something happened in my life that has opened my eyes to a deeper consideration for others, and I've become considerate of your well-being through our frequent interactions. I can look into your eyes and see a sincere respect and concern for your fellow man. Well, I too have been granted a deep concern for my fellow man, and that is why I am here. I am concerned for you, Norm, and I often worry about what might happen to you out on the dangerous roads of the city, Edna says. Norm is refreshed by the old woman's earnest heart, but he is also jolted in his mind back to the incident where he realized he could have died if he hadn't had the aptly timed stop. This memory intensifies his attention to what Edna has to say. The demons are becoming increasingly nervous. They know what is happening, and the longer Norm speaks with the bright, shining woman with the pure white hair and the dreaded blood-red balloon, the more they know they are in trouble. Suddenly, one of the demons leaps out from within the square of angels, who all immediately crouch down grabbing their sword handles, priming for action. The unclean spirit flies just up and over the angels, landing back down on the ground a ways off in the grass near a couple throwing a frisbee. 
Now this makes the angels nervous. The angels carefully watch his every move, as well as keep an eye on Norm, Edna, and the others. The remaining demons crouch in close to Norm, as if to cower, or to make themselves look small. Their close proximity to Edna causes two of the closest angels to step in closer, within a sword's reach. Edna continues, This life is fraught with danger, and the streets are one of the most dangerous places to be. You know this. Norm nodded and said, Yes, ma'am. At this point, one of the demons slips his hand up and touches Norm without the angel seeing. Norm sucks some coffee down the wrong pipe and begins to go into a coughing fit. For a moment, the coughing fit breaks up the mood and intimacy of the conversation, but Edna uses it for good. Patting him on the back as he settles down, Edna says, There, there. You see, even sitting on a park bench can result in something traumatic. Now, I know you're not as old as I am, but you've lived a decently long life, and I don't know what the increasing odds are on meeting death with every day, but I've seen all ages go. I don't take this lightly, and I have spent much time preparing for the inevitable, and I have thought a lot about what happens after we die. Have you, Norm? Norm is genuinely touched by someone he only knows casually from the bus, caring about his life to such a degree. The cold city has hardened his heart to a certain extent, but his defenses are down with this tender old woman who wants to give him some loving kindness. He replies, Well, I have been doing some thinking about it a certain bit this past year or so, and I admit it is concerning to me. That's good, Norm. It should concern all of us. Why do we go through life ignoring the inevitable? The most serious thing that will happen to us all, Edna relays. It's like we put on blinders to the truth. Just then a voice shouts, Whoa, look out! And before they can turn to look, a frisbee grazes by Norm's ear. Oh, sorry about that. I lost control of my throw, a man says as he comes running by to retrieve it. The angels had all seen what happened, and they had Edna protected from even the flying plastic disc. The angel closest to the demon by the frisbee players pulls out his sword, and points it at the menacing demon who's obviously playing the distraction card. The demon mocks him and spits on the ground between them. It was a cheap trick, and the demons are obviously beginning to take action. During the scuffle, another demon puts his hand on Norm from behind the bench. Norm, already a bit out of his comfort zone, actually stands up after the disruption and suggests that maybe they should walk and talk. This isn't ideal for Edna but she sees no reason why she can't continue with her message on the move. She quickly brings the conversation back to attention, for this isn't the first time she's noticed people's attention spans shortening at the thought of real, serious spiritual issues. Norm, what do you think happens after someone dies? She asks. Well, I'm not sure exactly. It's hard telling, not knowing, Norm replies, as they walk down a path that leads through a part of the park that has more trees. Do you believe there's a heaven? Edna asks. I hope so, Norm answers shortly. The demons are now beginning to feel desperate, and the angels are on high alert. Two of the demons jump up and fly up over the trees out of sight, while the other two walk as close to Norm as they can. Hunched over, like little demonic hunchbacks of Notre Dame, the demons are still a bit bigger than Norm, and their uneven legs make them waddle like a stereotypical hunchback also. Their wings behind them are constantly moving in place, obviously uneasy about the potential fight-or-flight scenario that could happen at any time. The angels, beautiful and strong, walk smoothly along on all four corners again, now with an especially high defensive alert with the two demons out of sight. Do you believe in God? Edna asks. The very question makes the demons shudder, and they both put their hands on Norm's shoulders. Well, I kind of do, but not really the god of the religions I've always heard about, Norm replies. It is still dusk, but the impending darkness has a weight to it that Edna can feel, like an uncomfortable uneasiness that suggests to her seasoned senses that perhaps something isn't liking what she is doing, and she isn't that surprised by the thought. Well, Norm, the god of the Bible isn't the same as the god of most of the religions you hear about out there. Not even some of the ones who claim to believe the Bible, Edna explains. Just then, a bush rustles along the side of their path, 
and a squirrel comes rushing out chirping, right at Edna. The nearest angel quickly draws his sword and slams it down in between Edna and the squirrel, and in a flash, the squirrel is deflected in what looks like a simple sudden change of direction after seeing Norm and Edna. It runs, as quickly as it came, back into the bushes on the other side. Edna's heart is racing from the startle, and Norm is amazed at the drama of this little adventure in the park. Norm starts to talk about these distractions, but Edna refocuses the discussion. Norm, this is what I want to tell you. I've been a faithful follower of the God of the Bible, and He's never let me down. I've been transformed by His living words, and I know that He is, and that what He has told us in the Bible is true. And in the Bible, He has given us His perfect standard of righteousness, and it is what we will be judged by on the day of judgment, Edna continues. Then, as out of nowhere, a man wearing dark clothes appears on the path ahead of them, walking their way. Edna wants to continue, but decides to wait for the man to pass. Just as the man begins to pass, the two remaining demon spirits shoot out to the sides, between the angels, with their swords out trying to catch them off guard. hey -yah! They both scream, swinging for a death blow. The angels duck and deflect their swords as the demons fly between them. Two of the angels take after the demons up into the darkening sky. One, trying to cut the fleeing demon off, Hyper boosts himself into the trajectory of its path, but the demon makes a quick about face and flies as fast as he can back toward the two in the woods. Down on ground level, the man in black makes a quick turn and strikes Norm on the head with the butt of a pistol and says, Don't move! Give me all your money! Edna is frozen stunned, and Norm is barely moving on the ground. Just as the angels step in to position themselves between the man and Edna, the renegade demon flying at top speed zooms through the two of them, striking one with his sword on his arm. The third angel, on his tail, flies in and immediately stops at his wounded friend, letting the demon go. Give me your money now, the mugger shouts, knowing he doesn't have much time. The two uninjured angels there immediately recognize the reality of the situation and lunge with their swords out, slashing upward in unison from both directions through the center of the mugger. Their swords catch the two missing demons directly in the heart of the man, and they are both vanquished into thin air immediately. The stranger then looks at Edna, and suddenly great fear comes into his mind. He makes one quick look around and runs back the way he came, disappearing into the trees. Edna and the remaining angels immediately drop down to Norm, and their collective concern and energy all work together in bringing him back to proper consciousness. At this point, the fourth angel returns. The wounded one asks if he got the demon, and he nods in the affirmative. Let me help you up, Edna coaxes Norm as he struggles to his feet. Are you all right? Yeah, I think so, Norm replies, still dazed. Let's go over to that bench and have a seat, Edna suggests. Norm silently agrees, and they slowly walk ahead and sit down. The feeling of danger Edna had sensed is past as she prays in her heart for Norm's recovery from the blow. Edna looks at his head and there is no blood or obvious open wound, so they figure he will probably just get a headache. A bump is definitely beginning to grow, but it is nothing he can't deal with. Oh, Norm, these cities are so fraught with danger in this day and age. People have lost their minds out here trying to get money and serve themselves. And the devil, Edna has to say. Norm sits quietly rubbing his head, and Edna takes the opportunity to get down to business. Norm, what I want to give you is very important. So important, in fact, that there are forces at work that don't want me to give it to you. It's God's law, Norm. It's God's holy standard that He will judge our lives with. The Ten Commandments, you know them. You shall not lie, steal, murder, commit adultery, covet, blaspheme, or make a God in your mind different than the revealed God in Scripture. Norm. If you've broken just one of those laws, you will be found guilty on Judgment Day. Edna speaks sternly and clearly. Have you broken any of those laws, Norm? Yeah, most of them, I'm sure, Norm replies with reasonable clarity. Well, so have I. The only one who has never broken one law of God is Jesus Christ. That's why He came, to sacrifice His life as a substitutionary atonement for our sins. 
We broke God's law, and Jesus paid our fine in His life's blood. Because of what He has done, we can now go free and be granted eternal life if we will repent of our sins and put all of our trust in Jesus and what He's done for us on the cross. Edna finally gets out. All of the angels gathered around are ministering strength and clarity to both Edna and Norm, even the wounded angel who is healing by the minute. Well, I've never heard it put that way before, but it makes sense to me, Norm replies, trying to keep his focus on the issue at hand. Thank you for caring enough to take the time to come and tell me this. Thank you, Norm, for agreeing to come and hear it, even if it almost got us killed, Edna says and laughs. They both laugh a good, long laugh, and with that, they stand up to make their way back. In the back of Norm's mind, he can't help but marvel at the seemingly random adversity that came along with Edna's spiritual purpose. He remembers what she said about forces opposing the message, and he can't help but wonder if that was the reason for such crazy disruptions on a simple walk in the park. He holds on to this most unusual experience and ponders it in his heart. Chapter 15. Something Different? Ricky, it's Jordan. One of Ricky's new friends from church greets over the phone. Hey, Jordan, how's it going? Ricky responds. Great, I'm so blessed. Wasn't that an awesome sermon by Pastor Duncan today? Jordan exuberantly inquires. Yeah, it was. I had a hard time keeping up with my notes, Ricky replies. Yeah, he's great. Hey, I was wondering if you wanted to come over later and help me with some extra biblical studies. I'm having a hard time understanding some stuff, Jordan asks. Um, well, I suppose I could try to help. I usually meet with the evangelism team down at the promenade, but if you really want my help, I suppose I could change my plans, Ricky says in an accommodating spirit. Oh, well, I don't want to be a bother. I just could use some help discerning some materials, and I was going to ask you to pray with me about some important issues I know about. Jordan responds, Well then, I would be glad to help. I'll be over around seven. Is that good for you? Ricky asks, thinking the spirit might be directing him to sacrifice his own plans to help someone in need. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Ricky. I'll see you then. After Ricky canceled with the street witnessing team from his church and got himself together after dinner, he headed down Straight Street to meet Jordan at his parents' house. Ricky hasn't really gotten to know Jordan, but they met at church and he seems to be encouraging and, for some reason, especially drawn to Ricky. Jordan's taking a liking to Ricky was evident by his quick openness and his regular revealing of personal information. Hey Ricky, come on in, Jordan invites. Thanks for coming over. Just then, Jordan's mother comes through from the living room on her way to the kitchen. Oh well, hello there Ricky, how are you? She asks politely. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? We are really well. I'm about to do some baking for the church cakewalk tomorrow. Are you going to come? Jordan's mother replies enthusiastically. No, I have other plans. Well, I hope you find yourself drawn to all the different church activities we have. I've been going to this church my whole life, and it's part of my spirit now. Maybe you would like to help us with our charity drives? Through the Lord's providence, we regularly give to the poor in a variety of ways. It's very fulfilling, she finishes. It sounds like it. Maybe I'll look into it, Ricky responds. Well, I hope you do. We need vibrant young men like yourself bringing new life to the party. I better get to baking. God bless you. We'll see you later, she says as she bustles off into the kitchen. Ricky can hear what sounds like a sitcom on the TV, with laughter coming from the living room around the corner. The pleasant smells of a recently finished dinner and dessert still hang in the air. The aromatic smells are just on the brink of fading into the transition of night, though it will be soon revived by more baking. They make their way upstairs in the nice upper-middle-class home and into Jordan's bedroom. They small talk about whatever is on their minds, and Jordan proceeds to make Ricky welcome in his room by showing and addressing his customized personal space. Ricky notices his LeBron James poster and other professional sports memorabilia, Jordan has a plethora of video games and an impressive collection of blockbuster movies. It's a really nice room, filled with a bunch of cool tech stuff that Jordan enthusiastically shows and shares with Ricky. After a while of playing around with secular toys following Jordan's lead, Ricky thinks for a moment and asks, So, how long have you been a Christian? 
Jordan replies casually, Oh, all my life. My parents have always been Christians, and so I've been going to church since before I can remember. I was baptized when I was seven, and I've been following the Lord ever since. After a moment of speculation, Ricky continues, Well, what were you wanting help with? Oh, yeah. Have you heard about the new apostolic reformation movement? Jordan asks. No, I haven't, Ricky answers. What about Jesus culture? Jordan asks. I've seen some t-shirts and stuff, Ricky replies. Okay, well, wait till you get a load of what's going on with the new generation of Christians. It's a huge movement that's growing like crazy. They are Christians who are really taking the Bible seriously and living out their faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's been tons of miracles being witnessed and performed in the name of Christ all over the world. There's a number of major churches at the forefront of a massive revival. People are truly believing the Word of God and stepping out in faith to actually live what they believe. Just like Jesus and the apostles, modern-day believers are working signs and wonders like healing the sick and casting out demons. Plus, they're finding out all sorts of new revelations from God, and He's working amazing miracles that we never thought of before. I've got this book from a church in California, and I feel led to share it with you. Maybe that's why you're here tonight, to find out about all of this. It's so exciting. I'm just so bored with the older generation of Christians who only seem to read the Bible and never do anything, and are docile like dinosaurs on the verge of extinction. Ricky looks at the book and says, Hmm, well, it sounds interesting. I'll check it out. Jordan continues to encourage Ricky with websites and GodTube channels to check out as well, and Ricky is amazed at how much seems to be going on in the name of Christ that he hasn't heard about. Maybe it was of the Lord that I was led here tonight? Ricky is very zealous for the Lord, and he wants to know the full extent of God's will for his life and the world. After they talk a bit more about this movement, Jordan regresses back to discussing personal interests. After another hour or so, Ricky remembers what else he had come for. Didn't you want me to pray with you about something important? Ricky asks earnestly. Oh yeah, I know someone who really needs prayer. Actually, there are several people. Do you want to pray with me now? Jordan asks. Yeah, let's do it, Ricky answers, bowing his head and closing his eyes. Dear Lord, we are here to ask your help for our dear brothers and sisters in Christ. First, we would ask that you help Sandy in her walk with you. I know that she is often tempted by sin and that she has many vices. Please help Sandy to stop her binge drinking and her smoking. Please stop her from her wild partying and fornicating. We know she has even gone so far as to have an abortion that not even her parents know about. And so, we pray that you will open heaven's blessings on her and help her get her life in better order. Let your river of life flow down and wash over her and bring her to your light. Lord, also we must pray for John Williamson and his family. He and his wife are on the verge of divorce because of his cheating last month, and it is affecting their entire family and even their friends. Help him with his temper and stop him from hitting Joanne any more when they fight. We know that when they don't come to church, they are fighting again. Father, please also help Roger with his experimenting with drugs. Make him stop seeking evil and transform him in your glory. Bring him to the light and purify him in your blessed fire. Keep him from continuing his pursuit of pornography. Please get him back on track with your will and ways. Help him to see how your glorious power is working in the world and that you are the miracle maker. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jordan finishes. Amen, Ricky says, feeling quite uncomfortable. For though he knows of the people they prayed for, he doesn't really know them very well personally. It seems excessive to be thrust into the sin-stained personal lives of people he doesn't know. Yet, he isn't sure if that's what the body of Christ in intercession is for. Maybe those people really need his prayer. It certainly sounds like they do. But something doesn't quite feel right to Ricky. He wants to help those in need, but he can't help but wonder if this is the way to do it. After another hour or so of secular socialization with Jordan, Ricky heads home with an unusual feeling in his soul. He doesn't feel like he does when he finishes the public evangelism ministry that he is usually a part of on Sunday nights. He feels, ultimately, unsure about the mysterious movement he has left to ponder, as well as with the interaction and the prayers with Jordan. Though he left fulfilling his obligation, he didn't feel any real sense of accomplishment. 
There was something off there that he just couldn't quite put his finger on.